So for this panel, um, I thought I wanted to, uh, I would uh, talk a bit about um, topics that uh, the four of us uh, have not yet uh, spent um, you know nine bazillion nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine and uh, ninety nine times uh, speaking, um, and uh, kind of go in, in, into a bit of a different direction, and, and particularly to think uh, talk more about the uh, Ethereum Foundation. Uh, so. I guess the uh, first question for Aya uh, would be, how, like, what do you see as being the uh, Ethereum Rolls Foundation in the ecosystem? Like, what do you see as being the role of the foundation to do? What should the foundation support? How should the foundation support things? And uh, what, what kinds of things are ultimately up to the ecosystem? Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin. Uh, yes, actually, we never had this kind of panel, so <laughs> it's kind of like having a mm. small EF meeting here. Uh, EF law, before talking about what is the role of Ethereum Foundation, I think it's important to say that I, um, the role of Ethereum Foundation should change or mm -hmm. shift, and it has changed and shifted. Um, and the reason why is that is the Ethereum, also the ecosystem, we support the Ethereum, um, you know, development of the platform protocol layer, but also other things in the ecosystem. And that is a living thing. It changes all the time. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's like a inverted pendulum. Like mm -hmm. you actually have to shift Mm -hmm. like, uh, the, to, to find the best balance uh, according to the stage of Ethereum or the stage mm -hmm. of Ethereum ecosystem, what needs to be done and then what are already being done and whether we should support things directory or indirectory. I think the more indirectory, the better because that means the ecosystem is more decentralized. But at the same time, some, of, some things don't really happen organically. Um, and sometimes we need to, the Ethereum originally, or even EF, was very small. And it was a kind of collection of developers and researchers that fit into one room, right? That was DevCon Zero, was like that. And then this ecosystem grew, and there are a lot of people who are contributed to, contributing to the protocol layer. And the EF needs to start supporting those people outside of EF. That's one thing. And then a lot of teams are working together even for the merge. A lot of teams outside of EF are being involved. And someone needs to coordinate this, these um, teams that are, don't belong to one company. Or that's, that's like a huge project being done in a decentralized way. Uh, and that doesn't work effectively without someone coordinating things. And so EF needs to support the coordination work, whether we do that directory or indirectly. So there are all those things that um, someone needs to do, and we are a nonprofit, especially public goods that do not have business model, um, are not normally supported. So we try to support those things. But if we, there are other uh, teams who can do the similar work that EF does. That's even better. So I think the goal is to make this, the, the, the work of building ecosystem decentralized too, but then like there are a lot of things that needs to be done still. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, zoom into a couple of like, specific um, parts of the uh, Ethereum ecosystem. So first, uh, research, uh, Dinkred. What do you see as being the uh, research team's uh, role? Like, how would you, how do you perceive the uh, research team uh, from the inside, um, and how has it changed over time, and uh, how do you expect it will keep changing over time? Yeah. So um, the research team looks at uh, basically the future of the Ethereum protocol and thinks about like what needs to happen, uh, what upgrades do we want to make, and uh, and basically researchers. Um, like the particular parts, say cryptography, networking, uh, security aspects, scalability, and so on of these things. And um, in terms of um, how it's changed, I mean, I think like from my perspective, I would say like 
um, there was a huge change about like one and a half years ago when um, we uh, finally launched the beacon chain. Basically, like at that point, um, the research team changed from this sort of crazy uh, blue sky thinking to like actually shipping things and actually like um, being very concretely focused on like things that uh, that um, that have to happen. Um, but also at the same time, uh, what we started doing is we uh, started hiring um, a lot more researchers. Uh, some of them, for example, sitting right here. Like uh, we started uh, building out the cryptography team. So like something that we didn't really have a few years ago was like expertise in all those different domains, um, say security, cryptography, and so on. We had like a lot of generalists, and now we added people in all these specific uh, domains. So like at the same time, basically, it's kind of part of it has narrowed um, to like the concrete upgrades that we have made, but part of it has also broadened to like um, all the different aspects and people who do specialized research. Um, yeah. Amazing. Um, so, Justin, um, one, I think, like, unique aspect of the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, and uh, it's, interestingly enough, a way that we kind of differ in the same direction from both Bitcoin and kind of some of the newer chains that kind of and just more strongly emphasize higher scalability, even at the cost of other things, is the uh, multi-client uh, development approach. Um, so... How, do you th how well do you think the uh, multi-client uh, development approach has gone? Um, and what do you think could we have done better and what do you think uh, could we do better? Right, so the model is, is pretty unique in the blockchain space, as you said, but it's reminiscent of the IETF model, I guess, for the internet. So we have this, this standards body that's kind of responsible for um, you know, well-defined well specs, and then you have all the different browsers organically from the ecosystem come in and the fact that there's this very clean of concerns um, is, is good because it gives us more modularity more more, more robustness um, in, in in terms of the success of the consensus client diversity it's been much much higher than what I expected um, you know like we historically it's been difficult for for the execution clients right we've had several attempts historically that have just died out o o over time and uh, we've had this this this, this gift monoculture at the execution layer um, but the, f the the fact that we have so much client diversity i guess is can be attributed maybe to a couple of things one is good design at the at the specs level right so there's like these these in protocol incentives to, to not have correlated failures, and so it's the, actually your, your rational behavior to, to, to be embracing uh, client diversity. And I think the other thing uh, that the community has done extremely well is just nurture, you know, to a large extent through education, um, like, and, 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 and memes and, and kind of cu cultural aspects, um, the, the, the importance of, of, of client diversity. Um, and you know, we, we, one thing that has also been good, I think, is the the, the, the funding, right? So um, we have these external teams, and we've had this this this, this grant program, which was pretty um, no strings attached, I guess, um, which gave the teams a lot a lot of independence. But it does pose some questions around: uh, is the, is this sustainable? Um, and one thing that ideally would we'd see in the future is that it's not just the Ethereum Foundation uh, providing funding. I mean, already we, it's not the case, but more, you know, other other you know entities. You know, it could be DAOs, for example. It could be Uniswap DAO. It could be a Gitcoin or whatever. Like pro providing uh, more funding. And I guess the final thing that I say that I think has been successful for the. For, from the client diversity standpoint is that we haven't been afraid to be uh, pragmatically more centralized in, in, in some places. And I think one, one place here is security. So within the Ethereum Foundation, we have kind of this um, in-house security team, which all the different clients can't necessarily um, afford to have. Um, and so we've... Uh, 
we've been able to keep the, these teams nimble while still basically providing a, a very critical service uh, to them in, the, in, a, in a support role perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, ah, yeah. So, um, one thing that I think we uh, generally value at the Ethereum Foundation is like the very in geographically distributed and uh, global um, nature of our community. Like, I think we uh, value, um, you know, Ethereum being a place where you don't have to, like, you know, physically live in New York or whatever to kind of feel like you're at the center of things. And especially, you know, in the context of censorship resistant discussion, uh, resistance discussion, it's uh, becoming an even more salient issue. Um, so what do you think, like, what is the uh, Ethereum Foundation doing? And what do you think we can do more of uh, to try to improve our uh, geographic diversity? Um. Yeah, I think it has been one of the challenges for this is maybe for anything like this. For example, mm -hmm. San Francisco Silicon Valley is kind of center of a lot of tech, tech things. But then uh, naturally, uh, like also how Ethereum started, English speaking regions or geographic places had a more advantage. So we've been trying to, for example, like Ethereum.org has now like 48 languages on the website. That's like a, you know, it, 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 it's like a minor, it, it sounds like a minor thing, but it's, I think, a huge progress that the community made to make more, make Ethereum technology and information more um, like, you know, like it's easier access to the information. And that's a one simple thing. But for example, so we also support uh, one of our EF fellowship programs. Fellow is working on this Giga project that is, you know, run by um, UNICEF and and other teams is connecting schools uh, with internet. And if you don't have internet, you can't really basically do anything with this. So that, that kind of thing, and then they're also using, like, you know, the Ethereum technology too for, to coordinate the work or payment and the finance um, is mechanism uh, between government or city, uh, schools, and internet providers. So there are many, like, things that applications can do, but also we can actually pro proactively support underrated communities or communities who are already happening, but maybe their, their voice is not heard enough. Um, so we need to kind of, like, do proactive approach to find them, but also support them. Um, and then that's another reason that we are blending DevCon this year to Bogota, Colombia. And then there is huge, huge, you know, communities in um, this activities happening in Latin America. And and then it's not like us doing everything. It's more like we just su are supporting, but also are seeding plants there. And then just by blending DevCon, communities are excited. There are more things happening. Yeah, so that kind of proactive activities are very important, but it doesn't really just happen naturally because, again, always English-speaking regions are more dominant <laughs> naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, Dinkred, um, what uh, what kind of uh, I guess a person uh, do you th do you find is like generally most able to be happy and productive as a uh, Ethereum Foundation um, researcher or developer, um, and if someone in the audience uh, wants to like, join the uh, research and development community, like what kind of advice would you uh, give them? Um, yeah, I think generally it's very diverse. I think I would uh, speak more for the researcher than for the developer because I don't know so much about that role, but um, what I would say is uh, um, one thing that uh, is very important um, is that that people are self-starters and are able to like work quite independently. I think that's like the one thing where I think it's very hard uh, to make any compromises because I think we just don't have the currently like the infrastructure and ability to like manage people who who don't do that. But otherwise, I think like. Um, almost anyone uh, can thrive as long as they're happy with this way of working, with like um, being very decentralized, maybe in most cases not having an office and uh, 
yeah, if, if they're happy to contribute to that and uh, believe um, in decentralization, then I think like um, lots of people can thrive. Mm -hmm. Uh, Justin, um, one thing that um, you kind of bring to the foundation that it, um, I think I really value is the uh, kind of cross blockchain and cross institutional cooperativeness um, that we have, right? So we have a lot of uh, you know kind of co-funding and other kinds of uh, partnerships with Filecoin and um, you know other blockchains. Um, so can you I guess give some ex uh, some examples of that and also just like what is your g general philosophy that uh, goes into you know how we can be a more positive sum player in the uh, ecosystem? Right. Um, so uh, we have had a lot of collaborations I guess with the the, the Filecoin stack. So um, one of the interesting things is that we've, at the peer-to-peer -peer layer, we've just reused lib P2P, and that's, I think, been, uh, been a great success uh, at, at the consensus layer. Um, we've also been, you know, collaborating on, on R&D, um, you know, in the, you know there, there was some shared research on accumulators, for example, shared research on, 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 snark, uh, on snarks. Uh, shared research on, on, on VDFs, um, and I think there's, there's kind of quite a bit of alignment um, in terms of supporting public goods um, between different foundation and the, 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 the Falcoin uh, Foundation. Um, and I think part of the reason why this collaboration has worked so well is that we're not competitive in the sense that uh, right, Falcoin is all about this, this, this data kind of storage and retrieval layer, whereas Ethereum is more about smart contracts. And if you want to build a, you know, a, a decentralized application, then you, you need both. So actually, we're, we're, we're complementary. Um, in terms of the other blockchains, I think a lot of them have had uh, you know, in, interesting ideas. So for example, you know, Definity was using BLS signatures, and that was you know, partly an inspiration, I guess, for for you know, pushing them in, 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 into Ethereum, um, you know, and we can look at other blockchains. You know, there was Algorand, for example, that had this, the secret leader election, and you know, we try and understand uh, and, 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 and keep an open eye. Um, the good news, the good thing about technology is that we don't have to explicitly opt in to collaborate, right? Because it's all it's all open source. Um, even though one thing that I'll say that is kind of a, a friction point. For, for, for collaboration, and it ends up sh kind of shooting back uh, at, at, at these um, projects that, that don't play super well is one uh, trademarks and the other one is, 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 is bad licensing. So, you know, we try and encourage folks to license under, you know, Apache 2.0 and, and MIT to facilitate this frictionless uh, collaboration, and we also encourage projects to not just not patent uh, any ideas and you know if you look if you take Algorand I, I'm not just picking on one but there's, there's many others like the, the the white paper has like 30 patents and I think one, one of the realizations for me is that for the last few years is that the, the technology play actually plays a fairly minor role maybe it's like 20 percent and then the 80 percent is is the communities the culture it's it's the legitimacy at, 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 at the meme layer, at, the, at layer zero, and um, if you if you're able to foster collaboration with with good ideas and good licensing and no patents, um, then that gives you so much more value at at, at, the, at the layer zero. That um, unfortunately, we I think we've seen a lot of uh, projects um, not do so well, and and therefore not lead to. S as many collaborations as they, as they could have been if they um, had, had played this, this people's game, this meme game uh, better. Mm -hmm. Okay, Aya, um, uh, um, so what are some uh, things that the foundation does um, aside from uh, research and uh, development that like, you think are important uh, to highlight and like, what other things do you hope we could be, do uh, be doing? Um, yes, so we do, uh, we just don't, give grants, um, we, we do coordinate a lot of things, and then that includes, so there are R&D uh, teams within the Ethereum Foundation, but also um, there are people who are working on, we call it ecosystem development work. 
and, and then there are a lot of teams within that cluster, uh, like, you know, uh, we, we say our teams are loosely coupled, uh, but we, we have, we share the same mission and principles, and those teams actually always try to find ways to support, um, you know, support the ecosystem. Like, what is the best way to support the ecosystem? And uh, DevCon team is one of it, but then also there are a lot of uh, geo geographical, like, you know, like proactive work, or depending on the domains, um, like what do we need to do for specific domains to, to grow um, kind of thing. So there are different teams working on different things, but, and then I think mainly they don't really develop, like they don't, their project is not to develop something, but it's more to support. Um, so this work, it wasn't necessarily when Ethereum was really small, and then like again, like all the teams are working in the decentralized ecosystem, and then like there's someone needs to coordinate the work. There are a lot of scaling work happening, but then like someone needs to coordinate the communication, someone needs to co coordinate the, uh, the discussions and debate. So um, we we try to add the work that is necessary for the Ethereum ecosystem, and I do think that's like a increasingly becoming more important because there are so many who can develop and do research outside of EF, but who can do the coordination, and we would love to have others who can do the coordination together, and then there are others who are doing this already, but, but that's still um, one of the important loads of EF. Okay, okay thank Red. Um, so the Ethereum research team, I think, uh, so far, as far as kind of sub-disciplines, right, we have um, just Ethereum protocol-focused um, uh, stuff, um, and uh, there's a cryptography team, and there's an increasingly, like, a rig and some of, like, these um, efforts around um, economics. Um, do you, like... How do you, how do you think we can improve kind of the parts of the... Uh, of, of the research team that like focus on those kind of like specific areas of study, um, and are there other like academic disciplines that, that you think the Ethereum Foundation should have a yeah, research bubble for? Right. Um, I mean, the second question is uh, kind of easier to answer. I think like mm. one area that um, mm. that we need to invest more in. We've just started would be networking. I think like we've. Mm. Uh, now hired one researcher specifically for that, but I think um, uh, more are needed here because it's really like a kind of, um, yeah, a point where we're a little bit blind still. Um, uh, in terms of uh, what the research team could do better, I think like um, uh, one, one thing that we're just learning is, uh, is like a better coordination overall because we're, we've like hmm. become so much bigger over the last uh, one and a half, two years. Uh, so now we really need to like um, in, increase like uh, our skills at actually working together because it's not the same working with five and with 25. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Justin, um, to continue a bit the kind of collaboration topic, um, how about collaboration with things outside of like the crypto space proper? So could include hardware companies, um, could um, include um, you know more kind of more general um, outside of crypto open source stuff. Um, what do you, what do we do, and what do you think can we do? Right. So the the way that I see it is kind of. The blockchain, the frontier of the blockchain space, just keeping on increasing and then kind of gobbling up more and more uh, pieces of the world. So just like you know, s software eat the world, um, mm. blockchains uh, eat the world. And um, I think one one of the disciplines that has recently fallen uh, in and kind of engulfed by by by, by blockchains, well, it's it. It started, I guess, with cryptography, right? So, mm -hmm. if you look at crypto conferences, you know, even the top ones like like crypto, um, a large portion of papers were, were were motivated by by blockchains, and you can you can do statistics on how many have the word you know Ethereum or blockchain in the abstract, and it's 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 a it's a huge percentage. Um, and not only is it leading to lots of open problems, but you know it's also a source of funding, and it's also a source of meaning for cryptographers because um, we get to 
use their work you know pretty quickly like oftentimes as a cryptographer you invent something and then it kind of goes unnoticed for years until maybe if you're lucky uh, it gets used but um, you know I think of Ethereum as being kind of a, a, a machine um, for, for turning uh, what's, what's known as applied cryptography which is not really applied into real world cryptography which is actually applied um, and there's, it's maybe one of the most powerful machines to do so and um, cryptographers appreciate us, us for that um, and I think the next stage is, is hardware engineers and that's actually related to cryptography because a lot of cryptographic operations are very demanding um, from a com computational standpoint, you know, we have snarks today, but then maybe in the future we'll have, uh, um, you know, FHE or, or, you know, IO or, you know, other very interesting things. Um, and where, you know, even, even just for, for BLS signatures, we, 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 had, we were at a point where we had so many validators, you know, we, we need to be able to support a million validators or even more than a million. Um, validators and that, that put a lot of pressure on BLS aggregation and we have an initial you know we have this this blast library which was basically written by by, by uh, hardware optimization um, uh, e experts and it was good enough to, to get us you know to, to the point where we are today but we're going to be putting even more pressure on, 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 on aggregation you know with things like single slot um, Finality, um, and when it when when it comes to to to, to zk rollups, like the, right now the the prover performance is the big bottleneck, and so that is uh, leading quite incredibly to the emergence of a whole industry of, of of companies that are doing hardware acceleration. And so I now have a little spreadsheet which keeps track of every single hardware company that approaches me, and there's more than ten of them. Uh, some of which like have raised a lot of money. So one one company, for example, raised seventy million dollars. And this, th these are companies you haven't even heard of because they're all working in stealth. Um, and about half of these companies are actively building towards build, uh, like a, a snark proving ASIC. So it, it's 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 an exciting thing that you know we've been able to absorb and kind of n uh, nerd snipe these developers and. It's, it, it's hard to predict, you know, who are we going to, to nerd snipe off, after the hardware engineers. Um, it could be the networking engineers, as, as, as Dankrat said, that would be a good outcome. Um, I think we also need a lot of security engineers and, and formal verification engineers. Like, if you look at the complexity of ZK VMs, for example, it's, it's orders of magnitude larger than, like, bridges. And we can't even get bridges properly, mm -hmm. <laughs> working properly. So we're going to need to hire an army of security researchers um, to, to get where we want to be. OK. Um, open question to all of you. Like, what are some radical and crazy um, ideas that you, might, that, that you think the Ethereum Foundation might want to consider doing? Like, should we invest $20 million into people building secure, just general purpose operating systems? Should there be an Ethereum city? I mean, just anything. Go. Crazy one, just Justin. <laughs> good at, you're good at crazy. It feels like a quest for Justin, yeah. <laughs> well, we're already doing this one crazy thing, which is to manufacture these um, these VDF ASICs and airdrop them for free to thousands of people, with the hope that at least one person will be running the hardware. Hmm. Um, and I think there is a, maybe a similar model to be had for uh, snark proving, right? Because Really, what we what we need for decentralized uh, snark proving is uh, is this honest minority thing, where we just need one single person to be online and have the computational resources to be to be proving. I mean, right now it's extremely centralized in the sense that you're going to hire um, you know an AWS cluster of of of, of servers, and it's going to be this this centralized uh, uh, prover. And if AWS goes down, your zk rollup goes down. Um, and so, like the, the 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 crazy vision kind of that I have is, uh, you know, let's just build these snark prover ASICs so that you can be a home prover with a little box. Um, and the 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 crazy thing is that this little box doesn't have to even be running. The only thing it has to do is be connected to the internet. And 
be ready to act as a fallback if the centralized prover goes down. Um, so it doesn't even consume electricity, it doesn't make noise, it doesn't produce heat, it's just there for, for the, the, the credible decentralization. Um, and I don't know if what I can say something like crazy enough, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, like, like uh, what Justin is saying and also all these ideas, there are, like we say, three guiding principles that EF has. One is um, long-term thinking, the one is subtraction, and the last one is stewardship of values. And there's like an Ethereum, Ethereum, there are values that Ethereum ecosystem believes and has, and it's not like we decided, EF decided, it's more like it's you know, open source, um, permissionless, privacy and all this, and how do we maintain that? It's, it's yes, like we need to think about, you know, that how we can make it, we can maintain that by technology, but also I think there, are, um, you know, like we need to have more discussions, like about this philosophical discussion and how do we make that happen, that kind of thing. And I always think outside of the technology and yeah, and I do, I do think that's going to be, be increasingly important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because, because the ecosystem is growing and then it's becoming like a, you know, like it's, it's not like small group in one same room. So the communication and being aligned is becoming more difficult. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we can invest in this. Mm -hmm. You wanted to add something? No, just uh, just remember that one of the crazy ideas that I had, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, was to um, to set up some sort of a large fund, um, you know, that is that is co-funded by 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 various uh, institutions. So it, so it could be you know a hundred million from different foundation, a hundred million from the Fal Falcon Foundation, and a hundred million from the Uniswap Foundation, and this large pool of of, of money would go towards dramatically accelerating the the R and D around cryptography because I think, you know, going back to this idea that you know if Ethereum is a machine to, from turning applied cryptography to real world cryptography, it's going to be a, a much bigger machine moving forward um, because we, we right we we're building these crypto economic systems and wow. one of the things we 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 found is that um, once you've nailed the, the economic part, you know, with just this, this really high-grade economic security, then from there onwards is, is cryptography. And so the, the, the economic part is bounded and contained, but the, the cryptography, you know, your, your imagination is the limit. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at where we are right now for cryptography, we're going to look back in 20 and 30 years and, and say this is so primitive, just like we look back at the cryptography you know, 30 years ago and we had you know, hash functions and signatures and that's just so, so primitive compared to the, to the ZKVMs that we're building today. Um, and I think in order to get to where we want to be, you know, which includes witness encryption, it includes IO, um, it includes like FHE, then we, we, we really need uh, an, to grow 10x the number of, of, of uh, cryptographers. And this is, this is a slow process because um, you, we need to educate these people. Um, it's not just about nerd sniping them and then they become productive a month later. It, it's really like a, a whole career, you know, that may take half a decade. And so we need to be planting seeds now if we want to go see results in 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So um, another question to everyone, and probably one that, made, that would have made more sense as a, as a uh, first question than a last question, but uh, I just came up with it. Um, what are the yeah you know, like uh, um, what aspects of the uh, Ethereum ecosystem or like what things in general motivated you to uh, work at uh, the uh, Ethereum Foundation specifically? I mean, I was just nerd sniped. Um, <laughs> so specifically, there was this um, this one talk that you gave on data availability, and I think. Um, giving talks where we present open problems is a good strategy to uh, to, to, to recruit people, um, and I think we have, you know, uh, actually workshops organized uh, where, like, the whole point is to try and communicate um, these 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 open problems. 
but I guess, yeah, even though I, I, I came in being nurse night, I kind of stayed for, for, for much deeper reasons. Um, and I think now what, what kind of keeps me, keeps me in within the firm foundation is like all sorts of ways to, to I guess, enrich myself. Uh, and I don't mean this in a financial sense because you, um, if you want to ma you know, maximize your financial return, do definitely do not join the firm foundation. Uh, but the FM Foundation is valuable, you know, just from a, you know, a knowledge standpoint. It's also va valuable from, from a community standpoint, like the people you get to, 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 to work with. Um, it's also, you know, valuable from a reputational standpoint, like the fact that we, we, we get to, to, to participate in these, in these panels and talks and whatnot. Um, and so the... You know, there is a, a, a lot of potential value to be, to be gotten uh, working at the firm foundation. Things that are not, not economic, but maybe like so much more valuable than, than, than economic returns. One thing I would add uh, to that is, um, I think two things that I found uh, very appealing from the very start in the Ethereum community is uh, uh, pragmatism and openness. So like one thing that really like, Immediately, when um, when I started, like first talking to people, I think it was around uh, 2018. It was like people were always interested, always open to new ideas, but also were very pragmatic about implementing them and not like um, well. I mean, there is there are things we are also dogmatic about, but uh, but in many ways, like um, it, it's uh, much more pragmatic than other communities. Um, my motivation, well, I, my original motivation into crypto and blockchain before Ethereum time was uh, things like financial inclusion. But currently, the Ethereum Foundation has a very unique position, and then fortunate to be able to work with other community members and teams. Like, for example, like like a Brian who was on the stage from Zelux Park. Like, they're like our family member, very aligned with our values, but then we are kind of empowering them to, to become one of the important institutions and, and, and teams. And then it's not, it's what, what, what Danka just said, it's also like the great thing, but also it's very hard for us to do it that way. Like, I have this very normal title, but it's very far from regular executive director. <laughs> And it's like we don't really have control over things in the ecosystem, but we, we intentionally do it that way. Um, so it, it is definitely challenging. And I wouldn't say it's very easy, but I'm motivated by those teams um, outside of EF or around EF, like who are very aligned. And then I kind of like we are, yeah, I, I, I also feel empowered by, by empowering them. So that's, that's a that's my motivation. Okay. How about you, Vitalik? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the uh, Ethereum community has um, you know, a lot of uh, kind of positive uh, values that really set it apart from you know both a lot of other projects in the crypto space, but also even. Uh, a lot of uh, things outside of it, um, you know, the uh, kind of very positive sub nature, um, the um, kind of desire to be, you know, cooperative uh, with uh, other communities, kind of interest in, um, you know, openness, kind of uh, freedom, um, and um, all of these uh, values. But, you know, as uh, Dan Grad said, kind of uh, always uh, approached in a uh, pragmatic way that like really yeah, emphasizes like, you know are we actually accom uh, like accomplishing something useful here um just the you know, general friendliness and um, all of the yeah, amazing people in the ecosystem um so yeah i mean i think it's uh, a, lo um, a lot of those things and um, you know definitely the you know, just incredibly fascinating math problems um, at the center of it all continue to fascinate me as well too Okay, uh, yeah, I'm done.